tell me about the comic collection. Okay, the comic art collection here is about 80,000 uh, items of comic art, about which 70,000 or so are comic books. Uh, it was built mostly by donations. Um, started with Russ Nye, uh, who is sort of the, one of the godfathers of popular culture, along with Ray Brown. Ray Brown was at Bowling Green, Russ Nye was at Michigan State. And uh, Randy Dunk, I'm sorry, Randy Scott is the cataloger here, and he built the collection. Uh, I came here about two years ago. Um, to work on my doctorate in American Studies, and I've been going to the San Diego Comic Book Convention and uh, expanding our list of uh, uh, donors, publisher donors. Uh, also just getting uh, donations from small press people and so forth. Um, scholars use the collection. Um, uh, I have a friend from the Smithsonian. He came in to do some research here. Another friend from Houston, uh, University of Houston, came in to do research. Uh, sometimes it's used by students for assignments. Um, American Thought and Language is a program uh, department that we have here, and a lot of times they use it. I've used it in classes that I've had. I assigned uh, Bill Sinkovich. Bill Sinkovich is uh, um, brought to light. I assigned Bill Sinkovich is brought to light for uh, uh, part of a thing on the CIA. Um, also, just people in the community, students and so forth, will come in and read for pleasure sometimes too, just to keep up on what they want to read, that sort of thing. What was the uh, uh, original reason for the collection being compiled? Was it as a research tool for people, or was there some other motivation behind the collection? Yeah, in the, in the early 70s, the popular culture movement was starting, the Popular Culture Association and so forth. And so down at Bowling Green, they ended up with a department, and they have a popular culture collection, which is available for scholars. Up here, it's the same sort of thing. Russ and I made uh, some of his comic books and so forth available so that they would be preserved, taken care of, uh, made available for people, a public institution made available for the public to study. What was your position with the university? I'm a graduate student in American Studies. I have an assistantship. I teach a class called America in the World, uh, IH 201. And then what I do here is I edit Comic Art Studies. It's the newsletter uh, that the library publishes. It deals with uh, comic scholarship, library issues, these sorts of things. We have a comic scholars directory listing people who are doing work in comics. We have a comic scholars survey. I did that. So we tried, I tried to figure out what people wanted to say about comics, what needed to be done, what's been done, that sort of thing. So my position here is essentially a volunteer position, but as a graduate student, um, I'm sort of a spokesman for comic scholarship, as it were. I try to be a, a, a clearinghouse for information about it. We run calls for papers, uh, this sort of thing, run information about scholarship in the field of comic art. And so my position here is essentially a volunteer one because I'm a graduate student at the university. The uh, publication that you send out, uh, I would assume it's on a national scale? Yeah, uh, we have a thousand. We, our mailing address, mailing list is about a thousand people. It's uh, all over the United States and a lot of foreign countries as well. We have a lot of Canadians, uh, uh, UK, Australia, and several people in Europe, and then uh, some in Asia as well. What is a comic book? <laughs> what is a comic book? Uh, well, according to Scott McCloud, who just published a book called Understanding Comics, which is the, the poetics of comics, as it were, he defines comics as sequential art, uh, combinations of uh, visual and other images in deliberate sequence. So a comic book would be a collection of these. Uh, historically, comic books started out uh, as collections of comic strips. This would be in the 30s. Um, in the early 30s, 1933 or so, they started to collect strips and publish them. And actually, they did it so that they could run the presses all night. If they ran the presses all night, then they didn't have to clean them. So comics, comic books exist because the companies were too cheap to clean their presses. Uh, and then, so it's a bound booklet of uh, of comics in some way. And and around. 35, 36, they started to run out of reprints, so they wanted to do new stuff, and then they made new comic books. What distinguishes a comic book from a children's book? Well, that actually depends upon how close you get in the definition. In Scott McCloud's definition, uh, 
a children's picture book would be comics, essentially. I, def I distinguish the two um, in sort of from their source origin. Children's literature, sort of, or children's books, comes out of the book publishing market. Um, book publishers have a children's book section. Comic books are sort of a different medium altogether. Uh, they have different conventions. The panel, for instance, the word balloon, these sorts of things don't show up in children's literature. So for the way we look at it, conventionally a comic book looks different from a children's book. A children's book will be hardbound. Now some comic books are hardbound. They're collected hardbound, but usually they're printed on paper uh, with covers and so forth. They're also different size. The standard comic book is uh, it's about this big. Um, I don't know the actual measurements. Um, nine by five, something like that. Um, no. Well, anyway, I'm not sure the actual me measurements, but um, it's a little bit different. It looks different. It has a cover. Uh, it usually has advertising in it. Um, these are just some of the conventions of comic book publishing. I would differ, I wouldn't use that if I were make, attempting to make a definition of comics, but if you want to talk about what actually exists, comic books tend to be paper products uh, with word balloons, panels, these sorts of things, sold in specialty stores now, whereas children's books, although they have pictures and words, that's one of the definitions of comics, words and pictures. Although children's books have pictures and words, they look differently, they're, they're, they're made out of different materials, um, that sort of thing. It seems like uh, <coughs> comic books have often uh, gotten a bad rap in terms of, uh, uh, as compared to children's books, comic books would get the negative uh, connotation. Uh, do you have a, a reason as to why you think that might be? Yeah, traditionally, and this goes back, I just did a paper on this as a matter of fact, um, this goes back at least to the novel. I'm sure it goes back before then, but let's just talk about Industrial Lev Revolution right around there. In the 18th century, novels were looked down on. They would corrupt the morals, especially of the new readers, who were mostly women, sometimes children, the, the poor, um, the middle classes, groups that were looked down upon. They shouldn't, these people shouldn't be reading. And so novels were attacked for corrupting morals, and many people wouldn't uh, say they were novelists, and they wouldn't say that they'd written a novel. They'd written a, um, a prose fable or something, or a romantic, uh, you know, a romance, a prose romance, or something like this. Uh, they, they didn't have a word for it, and so the word novel came up. Came up. Then if you look at, in just this century, if you look at jazz and film, um, jazz was attacked. Uh, for being, you know, sex music. Oh, it's gonna, our kids are gonna listen to this and then they're gonna go crazy. They're gonna get into drugs and oh, morals are gonna go down. And film, film was also attacked early on. Um, it was mostly viewed by, because the large audience of silent film was immigrants. And, you know, the, 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 the uh, children, the illiterate, the children, you know, all this sort of thing, despised groups, despised literature for despised groups. And generally what's happened um, is that a lower, lower art form comes along and kicks it up. Uh, for novels, the newspapers and mass journalism of the 19th century kicked novels upwards. And then television, well, that turned, that turned uh, novels into an art form. Then with jazz, rock and roll came along. Oh, that was a horrible, oh, we couldn't have that. So then jazz got elevated because pressure from bel below. The same thing happened with film. Film wasn't an art form until television came along and pushed it upwards. And then all of a sudden, it becomes an art form because it's considered an art form. And the thing about comics, comic strips have been around roughly about a hundred years, uh, 1895 or 1896 depending on when you want to start that. And comic books have been around for 50, 60 years, you know, 1933. And the problem is, if this is a problem and I don't think it is, but one of the reasons comic books have gotten attacked is they remain the lowest art form. Uh, the same thing, this, you see the same attack on rap music, on television, on, uh, on lots of different art forms. And usually what happens is it's an art form that's enjoyed by people that society doesn't want to have its own freedoms and so forth. They want to try to kind of a dangerous class, as it were, a dangerous group of people, someone that, that society considers needs guidance. Children is one, uh, frequently the poor are another. And so comics, because they've, they've stayed for, for historical reasons in this country, this is not true in other countries. In Japan, everyone reads comics. 
uh, something like 30% of all published material in Japan is in comics form. In Europe, um, comic book artists go on talk shows. It's no big deal. They just go on and they say, oh, yes, this is my new comic. And so, you know, it's, it, nobody cares, basically. It's not any different from any other publishing thing. In America, it is a little bit different because there was an attack let on it in the 50s and so forth. And uh, so comics have maintained this image of being children's literature, even though they're not. Uh, most of the comics published today um, aren't marketed towards children. They're marketed towards adults. The average age in the comic book readership uh, is about 23, college-educated uh, male, basically. And so there's this misperception of comics, and I think comics have been attacked for the same reasons that novels, jazz, and film were attacked. It's a despised art form for a despised audience. Um, comics will grow out of that, I feel. As, as more work is produced, better work is produced, uh, work is produced by artists who have something to say. Comics is a medium of expression, and medium expressions get treated differently by different cultures. And our culture has chosen to treat them kind of shabbily, but then again, it's working its way out of it. What's the most positive thing that uh, you could say about comic books? The most positive things I could say about comic books would be, one, it's a medium of expression, just like anything else. It's, uh, it goes back to the 6th century in Japan, goes back to Mayan glyphs, uh, there's, there's Egyptian comics, you know, hieroglyphs and so forth. Um, there's uh, Minoan comics, there's uh, middle, you know, middle age European comics. So it's a, it's, a form of, it's a medium of expression. It combines, because it does tend to combine words and pictures, it gives you, as an artist, it gives an artist a chance to uh, control certain things. You can control the visuals. Um, it can be read, it, it, can, it can be read in private which has certain reading things along with it. It, it, it. You are actually reading words and pictures. It's a different kind of language. We're moving into a visual, an icon society. This is our culture. And so comics can quickly convey information. Um, comics are most useful. Uh, for an example, if you're on an airplane, reach forward in the seat in front of you. That's a comic. The thing, the illustration, it's a series of deliberately, it's a sequence of deliberately arranged images to convey information. You know, there's no, it doesn't say, oh, please go to the exit. Because if you had to read that in an emergency, you'd be lost. But if you pick that up, you know what to do. Comics have this power to convey information uh, very quickly, very economically. And so that's one thing that I would say about it. The second thing that I would say about it is comics are very accessible. They're, they're, they're quick and easy to read, which is one of the things that has kept them sort of considered to be a low art form because, oh, if anyone can access it, well, then it must not be good because things have to be hard. Things have to, oh, it has to be tough to be any good. Then, actually, it's interesting, that happened with English, liter English uh, um, literature in schools is that people didn't want to teach it because it was so easy. And then they made it hard as Greek and Latin, and then all of a sudden it was acceptable. So comics are accessible. People can learn to read through comics. Um, they, they taught Francis Ford Coppola credits comics with teaching him how to read. But obviously he's making films, so he learned to read in a visual style. He, he, I'm sure you know, his, his, he can do a lot with words, but he can also work with images. So that's the thing. The accessibility of comics makes them a language or a medium that spreads. It's, it can be worldwide. World wide. It can go, you don't necessarily have to translate all the words, people can follow it, but you can also learn to read another language through reading their comics. You've suggested that comics have an ability to convey a message uh, easily and efficiently. Mm -hmm. uh, people have learned to read by reading comics. Uh, do you see comic books as a medium ever being used uh, within school systems as uh, something of a teaching tool? Well, uh, they are being used more and more because I think that more um, teachers grew up reading comics and liking them, and so they aren't adverse to it. And I hope that that kind of thing will continue. I think that comics are uh, a good way for people to learn. A friend of mine says that DC comics should bring back Superman. They just killed off Superman, they're bringing it back. Should bring him back, and instead of having comic book writers and artists work on him, hand him over to children's literature children's books illustrators and have them do Superman 
as children's literature. You, then that way three-year-olds will start to read, because Superman is a wonderful character for children. You know, this bright blue, uh, you know, all personifies good, right? And children would be, learn to read that way because it's such an accessible medium. Um, and I do think that comics will be used more in the future uh, as we move into an icon society, a society that deals with things visually. We'll open it up. And uh, for instance, in France, though, the interesting thing is uh, if you look at Asterix and Obelix, they use the images that are common to school children's, um, they use the style and so forth that shows up in the textbook. And so school children go and they start reading Asterix and Obelix at the same time that they're reading things for school. And it's the same language, it's the same style and so forth. And it helps them learn how to read. And so I think that these things will become more common in the future. What do you find most positive about uh, comics today? The thing that I find most positive about comics today is the amount of control a creator potentially has. Now, while it's true that it, a lot of the comic book companies, it's sort of a factory line process, uh, it's, a, it's a collaborative effort, rather. There, there's a writer, an inker, a penciler, a colorist, you know, so it's a group effort. And in some, ca in some companies, that's sort of a factory line process. In other companies, it's, it's more collaborative and creative. But it's what I call a person, a pen, and a photocopy machine. There's this, been this great movement in the 80s towards uh, uh, small press comics or photocopy comics, mini comics, where someone draws it out on one page, folds it up, photocopies, staples it, gives it out. And it's something they can do, and it's cheap, and they, you know, they're not making any money on it. They're just giving it out. But they have this control over it. They can do whatever they want because the, the, uh, the, the, the costs are so small. You know, if you're going to make a movie, even if you're going to make a small movie, it, it takes a lot of involvement with other people, right? You you have to, if you have to get money, sort of, you know, work with other people that may want to change what you have to say. If you want to publish a book, you know, there's an editor who has control over it and these kinds of things. Well, comics, I think, offer control to the artist that doesn't exist in other media. Um, obviously, each media has its own amount of control and the different things. Each media has its own strengths and weaknesses. But in comics, you can control the, the image, the words. You can even do sound effects uh, through visuals. Uh, for instance, Frank Miller did one thing where he had a, a very large word balloon, very small letters. And when I, when I read it, I actually heard the character say, help, very, very quiet. And the same thing can be done with different typefaces, different lettering styles. Uh, for instance, there was a... Uh, there was a comic book where there was the Joker, and every time he spoke, his word balloons were drenched in red. Because that got across, the, the feeling of red, it came across so that you, you could do an accent. You can also do, Asterix and Obelix do this all the time. They, the Goths, the Germans, have a different typeface from the, uh, from the Gauls, and so do the Swiss. And the, the Egyptians in Asterix and Obelix talk in hieroglyphs and then it's translated down below. So you have this ability to do all these different things. In a movie, if you want to have a different language, you have to subtitle it, which means you're breaking sort of the, the beauty of film. In comics, you don't have to do that at all because you can just put it in a different type style, and the person reading knows that it's in a different language, and yet can read it. And so it, it's more immediate, it cuts that down. And so that's the, the best thing I think about comics, is the amount of control it potentially provides for the creator. Now, there's obviously industrial things, you know, uh, the way they're produced, marketed, and so forth, that may mitigate and change that. But in its purest form, uh, self-publishing, this sort of thing, um, it's there.